Hey everyone, today we're asking the question, could you beat up a grizzly bear? The origin of this video began some years ago when I discovered a survey which asked respondents if they thought they could defeat a number of different animals in an unarmed fight. And the results were pretty startling. 34 different animals were listed. Naturally, an obvious majority of participants felt comfortable going head to head with animals like house cats and geese. But a strangely confident minority of Americans polled, 8% to be exact, thought that they could take on a gorilla, lion, or elephant. Grizzly bears proved to be the most intimidating of the animals listed, with 6% of participants claiming that they could beat up a grizzly bear in an unarmed fight. Honestly, I have no idea what arithmetic the 6 to 8% of respondents were using to appraise their combat skills versus elephants, gorillas, lions, and grizzly bears. Who knows, maybe they just heard one too many Chuck Norris jokes. Or perhaps they were just joking themselves, knowing that they'd never have to take on any of these animals in real life and just couldn't resist the temptation to declare that they could beat up a grizzly bear. The thing is, this is more than an amusing thought experiment or a clickbaity internet poll. There are actual examples of people who have gotten into fist fights or wrestling matches with grizzly bears. Some quite recently, with some news outlets even sensationally declaring that they quote unquote won the contest. In today's video, we're going to examine their experiences, the outcomes, and discuss what should be learned from their stories. We'll discuss the good decisions that they made, as well as the poor decisions that were made. This is in no way an attempt to rub salt in anybody's wounds. The past cannot be undone. I'm focusing on the future, and I can't stop thinking about the people heading into grizzly country this year and next year. You might be one of them, and there's the possibility that you might encounter a grizzly bear. Keeping people safe requires informed and truthful discussion of attacks that have already occurred, and discussing whether certain decisions would have resulted in better outcomes. And unlike so many videos and articles on this topic, this isn't going to be an opinion piece. I reached out and discussed these events with Dr. Tom Smith, who in addition to having spent more than 30 years in the field with bears, is heading up a database that has documented and analyzed more than 1,000 bear attacks in North America. He has also authored and co-authored numerous studies on bear attacks, deterrence, and attack prevention. Tom has literally helped rewrite the book on bear safety. So, if you want opinion, go somewhere else. When it comes to the internet, you can literally have your pick. And in regards to topics like bear attacks and safety in bear country, opinions are getting people hurt and in some cases killed. Today, and in subsequent videos, we are going to try and clean up some of the mess and go over how you can be prepared and justifiably confident in bear country. So, if you haven't subscribed yet, now is the time to do it. Alright, let's jump in. October 15th, 2022. The setting? Shoshone National Forest. Four friends from the Northwest College wrestling team are hunting for antler shed southwest of Cody, Wyoming. The group of four separates into two groups of two. Brady Lowry and Kendall Cummings continue searching for sheds approximately one mile away from their friends August Harrison and Oren Jackson who have returned to their car. Making their way through heavy cover, Brady notices fresh bear scat and calls out to Kendall, who's an unspecified distance beneath him on the slope. That's when Brady notices a grizzly bear less than 15 yards to his left, estimated at 400 pounds, which then charged, knocking him down a ridge before continuing the attack, biting his left forearm, resulting in a compound fracture. Kendall, who is within sight, sees the attack and begins shouting and throwing rocks and sticks at the bear, to no avail. In an interview given two months after the attack, Kendall then says he reached for his pack but decided, quote, it's clipped in, I can't use that. Perhaps a reference to his bear spray, which all four party members are reported as packing at the behest of their wrestling coach. Now, Brady said that the bear attacked him before he could deploy his bear spray. And with initial contact with the bear at less than 15 yards, without a deterrent ready for deployment, that's absolutely what we would expect. A Kendall either did not have spray, decided it was inaccessible, or simply chose not to use it. Without a deterrent, Kendall's choices quickly became both poor and extremely limited. He could run away, which he said that he considered, stand by and do nothing, 
or try to save his friend with the only tools immediately available. That's when Kendall attempted to physically deter the bear, reportedly kicking, punching, and pulling on it. Stating after he pulled on the bear, they locked eyes for a second, at which point he said he took a couple of steps back before it rushed him, knocking him to the ground and then pushing him into some trees. After the initial attack, according to Kendall, the bear ran off. And thinking that the bear was gone, Kendall called out, Brady, Brady, you all right? Where are you at? A response came, but not from Brady, who had run up the slope to call 911. Stimulated by Kendall's calls for Brady, the bear returned and attacked a second time, inflicting serious wounds to Kendall's leg, arms, hands, head, and face. Kendall said of the attack, I remember it just picked me up off the ground and shook me, like I felt hopeless and small. Adding, after that I think it thought I was dead. It walked away, kicked some dirt on me, and left. Brady, having contacted emergency responders, was unsure if Kendall was still alive, but managed to meet up with Orrin and August on the trail, at which point the three companions then went in search of Kendall, who they later found bloodied, but walking down the trail at times even carrying him back to the car, where they were aided by a local hunter and emergency response personnel. It's an undeniable story of friendship, heroism, and survival, and given Kendall's efforts to physically deter the grizzly bear that was attacking his friend, the story was destined to become an international news and social media sensation. And I am deeply relieved that Brady and Kendall survived their ordeal and were supported by their teammates and community members. And they all deserve mad props for not abandoning each other in a desperate time of need. But their experience is also a wildly informative case study in bear attacks, bear behavior, and the consequences of decisions made in bear country. And if you ask me, it would be extremely irresponsible not to have a discussion about what ought to be learned from their experience. A conversation which has sadly been largely, if not completely neglected, by news coverage of the event. Now, I have personally witnessed grizzly bears attacking elk, facing off with wolves, battling each other, foraging, hunting, wrestling, cuddling, mating, sleeping, pouting. I've encountered bears on the trail, in my own campsite, after they've been hit by a car, and even accidentally at 30 feet with a grizzly bear on a kill. Put simply, I have encountered more bears in more situations than the vast majority of people will in their lifetimes. But, in asking important questions about Brady and Kendall's experience, I'm not going to rely on my experience alone. This topic is just too important. So I'm going to defer to Tom Smith and his decades of experience, data, and expertise on the topic of bear behavior and bear attacks. The goal is to rise above the internet's endless BS and get to the facts. Let's start with the headlines and news coverage following the attack. Now, these headlines may be eye-catching, but they're also objectively false and may well end up getting someone injured or killed. Let's start with the claim that Kendall quote-unquote won his match or that anyone fought off this grizzly bear. Those claims might sound nice and certainly they got some extra clicks online, but they're also a dangerous fiction. No one fought off this bear. The bear left when it thought it had neutralized a perceived threat. After leaving the first time, it then returned and attacked again when Kendall started calling out to Brady. This is standard grizzly bear behavior. They'll just keep coming back, according to Smith, until they no longer feel threatened. Kendall himself said that he felt small and hopeless. Now, does that sound like somebody who quote unquote won his fight with a grizzly to you? So why point this out? Listen, if Kendall had in fact won his contest with this grizzly bear, I would be the first to give him full credit for doing so. But I would immediately discourage anyone and everyone from Cub Scouts to Ultimate Fighting Champions and yes, even Chuck Norris from attempting to physically deter a grizzly bear. The problem is, getting into a physical altercation with a grizzly bear almost certainly prolonged the attack, leading to Kendall's more severe and life-threatening injuries. Speaking to Tom Smith about the event, he compared the act of fighting a grizzly to kicking your legs in an attempt to keep the Titanic from sinking. It was clearly a courageous thing to do, and it deflected the bear's aggression, but as a deterrent, 
It doesn't work, according to Smith. The imbalance between size, strength, and ability is just too, too great. You cannot punch or wrestle grizzly bears into submission. And that's why these headlines are dangerous. They give false life to the fantasy that you can beat up or fight off a grizzly bear with your bare hands. If you are ever attacked by a grizzly, your primary goal is to stop the attack as soon as possible. Ideally, by deploying an effective, readily available deterrent, or by convincing the bear you are not a threat by lying face down and covering your head and neck and remaining as still and quiet as possible until the bear has left and you can safely access your deterrent. According to Tom Smith, 95% of grizzly attacks are defensive in nature, meaning that the bear's only motivation is to neutralize something they consider to be a threat. And every single human on earth does the same thing at some point in time. Perhaps you've encountered a spider or a mouse or a snake or something, and feeling like it was a threat to you, you attack it to try and neutralize a perceived threat. It's the exact same thing, only we're used to being the ones doing the attacking. But engaging in a fight with a grizzly bear instigates further aggression and will multiply the severity and number of injuries. No responsible journalist or commentator would condone or celebrate getting into a physical altercation with a grizzly bear. Period. We're talking human safety for crying out loud. So, what would have been the best course of action for Kendall? Well, if Kendall had bear spray, it needed to be in his hand, strapped to his hip or chest, or in his front pocket, and immediately accessible. The honest truth is, if you don't have a plan, don't know what to do, haven't adequately prepared, or have rendered your deterrent inaccessible by leaving it in its packaging, putting it in your pack, or otherwise out of reach, you will not be able to make up for those poor decisions in the heat of the moment when facing down an agitated grizzly bear. There are consequences to choices made long before an attack ever occurs. Tom Smith put it this way, You look at all these incidents, and the people who see a bear coming and lay down the ones that try to outrun them, the ones that try to climb trees, the ones that punch them, that's what they do when they don't have deterrence because they have no other play. That's the common thread. That's what desperate people do. You're not going to outclimb a tree climber. Brown bears can go up trees a fair way. Certainly they can jump, says Smith. There have been people who have been dragged out of trees by grizzly bears. These are not successful strategies. But the one thread behind them all, they had no gun, they had no bear spray, they had nothing. An inaccessible deterrent is the equivalent of no deterrent, just as an unused seatbelt is the same as no seatbelt. Every time a person heads into grizzly country, they make decisions that potentially have grave consequences should they startle a grizzly bear. Kendall was ideally situated to spray the bear when it attacked Brady. Yes, Brady would have been affected by the bear spray as well. But compared with the alternative, there's no contest. According to Tom Smith, this strategy has been very successful at halting attacks in the past and is one of the many reasons why it's always ideal to explore bear country with at least one companion. Spraying the bear would have halted the attack against Brady and prevented Kendall's own injuries. But he either chose not to spray the bear or, more likely, couldn't because his deterrent was not accessible. Now, please understand, the absolute last thing I want to do is add injury to injury. Brady and Kendall's experience must have been terrifying, and it's almost guaranteed that the actual attack was briefer than my summary of the event here. And no one is going to make perfect decisions while in crisis mode. But that is exactly why correct decisions must be made before the crisis. Deterrence must be carried and implemented correctly, or they are of little to no use. This message is absolutely critical, and it's been almost completely neglected by the largely reckless news and social media frenzy that followed Brady and Kendall's ordeal. Here's an example. College wrestlers use athletic skills and teamwork to survive grizzly attack. As nice and heartwarming as that sounds, it's also simply not true. As I said previously, I give Brady, Kendall, Austin, and Oren full credit for not abandoning each other which according to Tom Smith has happened. Numerous people have been abandoned during bear attacks, even by friends. 
But Brady and Kendall's survival was primarily a figurative role of a four-sided die. Without the use of an extremely effective deterrent like bear spray, they were mostly powerless to affect the outcome. Four years before Brady and Kendall found themselves in the jaws of a 400-pound grizzly, a man named Mark Upton had an uncannily similar encounter with a grizzly half the size of the bear that attacked Brady and subsequently Kendall. Mark, a hunting guide, and his client had been searching for an elk that the client had shot the day prior. Upon finding the elk, Mark began field dressing the animal for his client when a 250-pound mother grizzly located the kill and challenged Mark for possession. In an instant, Mark Upton, like Brady Lowry, was in the jaws of a grizzly bear. And like Brady, there was someone nearby who might have been able to effectively intervene had the two parties been better prepared and made different decisions during the attack. The client had discarded his bear spray, leaving it with his horse hundreds of yards away, while Mark had discarded his sidearm when he began butchering the elk. And while Mark had his bear spray, he chose to yell and wave his arms rather than immediately readying his bear spray for deployment upon initial visual contact with the bear. In the chaos that followed, and absent bear spray, Mark's client attempted to use Mark's discarded sidearm, but being unfamiliar with the gun, accidentally expelled the clip before throwing the now empty gun towards Mark. The bear subsequently grabbed the client by the ankle, who managed to escape and, in his words, run for his life. Mark never got a hold of the gun, which, being empty, would have been useless anyway. In his description of the event, Mark's client reported that Mark, too, had been trying to fight off the grizzly. Mark was still alive when his client fled the scene, according to statements that the client made to authorities later. A conclusion supported by investigators from Wyoming Game and Fish, who also concluded that Mark had eventually managed to deploy his bear spray, ending the attack. Unfortunately, Mark had already sustained injuries that would prove fatal. Mark bled to death within minutes. His body was located the following day 50 yards from the attack site, his expelled can of bear spray a few feet away. The bears, both mother and cub, were euthanized, and investigators confirmed that the mother grizzly had been sprayed with bear spray. While discussing both Mark's fight and Kendall's fight with these two grizzlies, Tom Smith said, When a bear gets a hold of a person, my data shows that it's a 25% chance across the board. Minor injuries, moderate, severe, or death. Bears have thick fur, very thick skin, heavy musculature, a skull that you could hit with a sledgehammer. They can take a pretty good wampum, says Smith. Humans, by contrast, are nowhere near as strong or resistant to injury. We have thin skin, vulnerable veins, arteries, and organs. Compared to bears, we're fragile. Humans are simply not equipped to physically contend with grizzly bears. Bears can easily crush someone's skull or sever an artery in a single bite, and the longer an attack continues, the greater the number of injuries and the more opportunities to incur fatal wounds. Once a bear engages physically with a person, it's the role of a four-sided die, says Smith. Mark Upton got the bad end of things, according to Smith, adding, Kendall got the bad end too. His injuries are very severe, but he's going to recover. The takeaway you don't ever want a bear to touch you. If a bear does make contact, you want to make decisions that will shorten the encounter, not prolong it. I'll address this in coming videos when we discuss how to respond to aggression by black bears, grizzly bears, and polar bears. In the case of grizzlies, if a grizzly makes physical contact and knocks you to the ground, that's the time to play dead with your hands and arms covering your head and neck and protecting your vital areas. But there's more to bear safety than that. In coming videos, I'm going to address the absurd gun versus bear spray debate, give you hard data on their effectiveness, and how and when to use them both. We'll cover whether or not your dog is an asset or a liability in bear country, discuss what can be learned from other bear attacks, and examine what everyone misses about the most infamous fatal bear attack in history, which claimed the life of Timothy Treadwell and his girlfriend in 2003. So again, make sure to hit subscribe and turn on notifications so you get immediate access to those videos. To wrap things up, in the same way some people drive their whole lives without ever buckling their seatbelt or adhering to speed limits or getting into a car accident, 
Thousands of people recreate in bear country every single day, many of whom are ill-prepared or behaving recklessly, but who may never even see a bear, much less be attacked by one. Brady, Kendall, and Mark, among others, are simply among the few who had their readiness tested. Make sure if you find yourself in that position that you are 100% ready should your preparation be similarly put to the test. Now, I attempted to reach both Kendall Cummings and Brady Lowry whilst researching their experience, but I didn't locate contact information for Brady and I haven't heard back from Kendall. And I welcome any information that I may have missed in recounting their experience. And despite not being able to speak to Kendall in person, I'm still going to give him the final word on his contest with the grizzly bear. You can find this quote in a very recklessly titled article by the Washington Post. Before the attack, I had thought that I could take on a bear easily. Now I know that a bear is pretty legit. They are tougher, stronger, and bigger than I thought. I have to believe that Brady and Kendall, as well as the family of Mark Upton, would all want to spare others the pain that they have experienced, particularly in the case of the Upton family. What happened to Mark especially was a great tragedy. Let's not add to these tragedies by failing to learn from them or suggesting recklessly and falsely that humans can compete physically with grizzly bears. Bears are not monsters. They do not roam the landscape seeking to harm people. They live a hard life in the wild and can be aggressive if they perceive a threat to themselves, their offspring, or a food source. I have personally enjoyed responsibly observing them for more than a decade, at times getting remarkable glimpses into their secret lives. They are incredible, powerful, valuable, and inspiring animals. And again, deferring to Tom Smith, we already know how to stay safe around bears. The problem is educating people and sharing quality, reliable information, which has to swim upstream against opinions, falsehoods, and yes, sometimes irresponsible reporting. When prepared and educated, people and bears can absolutely share space. That is the purpose of this video and coming videos, to make available in one place the information you need to safely enjoy, explore, and spend time in bear country. And you can help get the message out as well. The internet responds solely to online activity in terms of watch time, comments, likes, shares, etc. Online algorithms can't tell the difference between weapons grade BS and genuinely reliable information and sadly often prioritize BS because it's sensationalistic and popular. Your help is needed to keep people safe. And in one way you're already helping, just by watching this video, leaving comments including your questions and your own experience, as well as liking and sharing this video with others, won't only help those you share it with, it will lead internet algorithms to share it more broadly. That's how you can make a difference and give purpose to tragedy by combating falsehoods and helping do what's best for people and bears alike. I want to take a moment and thank Dr. Tom Smith for both his work and for taking the time to share his expertise. I very much look forward to sharing some more of his insights with you in future videos. So until next time, this is Mike reminding you to stay safe, be prepared, and cherish your Wild Spaces adventures.